This video is the concluding part of a series where I have dug and refined local wild clay, made pots, fired them in an open wood fire with a view to cooking a meal in one of those pots, also over a wood fire. Along the way there have been mistakes, failures, lessons, retries and some little triumphs. Now we're finally at the part where I can use my clay pot to cook a meal. I have a choice of pots I could use for cooking this meal. This round pot, which I made from raw wild clay with added grog made from crushed pots that failed in earlier firings. This pot was painted with a pattern made from powdered rust. You can still just about see it in places. It's a nice shaped pot, but it may not be terribly practical for cooking, and it has a couple of small cracks in the lip, which might not take well to further heating. This shallow pot, which was made from refined wild clay with sifted sand and crushed pot sherds added back in, it was really tricky to make as the clay was really loose, but now it's a nice strong pot, perhaps a little shallow and small in capacity for what I have in mind. This egg-shaped pot, which was made from just refined wild clay with no grog or temper, this pot seemed like the strongest and most solid of the bunch, and I thought this was the one I would use, but on close inspection I see some thin horizontal cracks on the outside, about one third and two thirds of the way up. The cracks don't penetrate all the way to the inside, so it's probably okay, but I think I will probably not tempt fate by heating it again. Incidentally, a horizontal crack like this on a coil-built pot almost certainly indicates a failure to properly and completely bond one of the coils onto the layer below. Hardly surprising that this happened in a pot built from more than a dozen successive layers of thin clay coils. I suppose the optimist in me would say another way to look at that is the significant majority of my coils were bonded perfectly, except for these small bits here and here. So I'm not going to beat myself up over it, but I will just take a little lesson for future pots. Which leaves us this pot, which interestingly, despite all of the efforts to refine and blend clay, is the pot that I made from the unrefined wild clay. All I did was pick out the bigger pieces of stone and gravel, and wedge and knead the raw wild clay to evenly mix the different marbled layers of mineral that were in it. Other than that, this is made from the clay as it was when it came out of the ground. This is the pot in which I will cook my meal. First though, it needs a bit of preparation. I've thoroughly washed and scrubbed it to remove any loose dirt and ash and other contaminants, but I expect the first thing to be cooked in here might come out tasting of ash and smoke. So I will prepare this pot with a sacrificial meal to absorb some of that stuff. I don't enjoy wasting food, so the sacrificial first meal will be made from vegetable trimmings and peelings that were destined for the compost, together with a few scraps of tough bacon gristle. To this I'll add a little vinegar, some salt and water. Then I'll gently heat it over a small bed of charcoal embers, allowing the contents to boil and stew for a while, during which time starches will cook out from the food into the clay, helping to seal it a bit, and harsh flavours from the pot will hopefully be drawn into the mixture, which I will drain and throw onto the compost heap, which is where it was destined anyway. This is an unglazed earthenware pot. It's quite porous, but people have been cooking in unglazed earthenware all over the world for millennia. Water soaks into it and would eventually seep through it, but not so quickly as to present a problem. The porosity does mean that some of what soaks into the pot will be parts of the food itself, and that might sound like a hygiene issue. I suppose it could be, but for a pot that's heated every day, maybe multiple times a day, the stuff that soaks in is more likely to eventually just polymerize and carbonize and form a sort of seasoning, making the pot more watertight. As it was cooking, despite this being made from just scraps and peelings, it smelled really good. I let it bubble away for half an hour or so, and then took it away from the fire and placed it on a board to cool. Now I said I wouldn't eat this, and I won't, but I must confess I did have a little taste of the broth, and it was pretty nice, and I actually couldn't discern any unpleasant flavours from the pot. But anyway, there's the sacrificial non-meal meal cooked, and the pot shouldn't now shed anything much into the actual meal. After it cooled down, I drained it and put it into the compost. Tomorrow I'll use it in earnest for cooking. In preparation for that, I put about a tablespoon each of yellow split peas and pearl barley into a glass and covered them with water and left them to soak overnight. The next day, here we go, cooking in wild clay pottery. This isn't going to be a completely authentic Iron Age or medieval pottage type of thing, but it's somewhere along those lines. And interestingly, with this style of cooking, there's no browning or searing of meat or frying of vegetables. It's really a case of just throwing everything into the pot and cooking it long and slow. So here we go. A small shallot, carrot, celery, parsnip, a bit of swede, some of my dried foraged wild mushrooms, some wild garlic that I dried way back in springtime, some of my homegrown dried herbs, a little bit of salt, a little bit of roadkill venison that I had in the freezer, together with half of one of the venison kidneys, 
my split peas and barley, and then the rest of the vegetables. And then I'm going to top this off with beer, a ruby ale called Cranbourne Poacher, which is a nice sweetish ale that I hope will work well here. I'll keep the bottle handy nearby for topping up the pot in case it needs a bit. To keep any ash from falling into the pot, I'll cover it up with a cabbage leaf and weigh that down in place with the bottom of one of my first round of pots that cracked in firing. I cook the stew in the pot in the wood embers for a total of about two and a half hours, every now and again taking it out to rearrange the fire and top up the liquid that had been lost through evaporation or boiling over or perhaps a little bit of soaking into the pot. The heat level of this sort of cooking fire is a little bit wild, but it can be tamed. If you add smaller pieces of wood, it burns hotter. If you add larger sticks and logs, it slows down and burns a little cooler. Even so, I did have some problems maintaining a low heat under this pot. I think it would be easier in a much bigger pot with greater thermal mass in a bigger hearth. About half an hour before the end of cooking, I took it off the heat and added some little dumplings, just five ingredients, beef suet, flour, salt, herbs and water. Then I put the lid back on and returned it to the fire for these to steam in the top of the pot. At the end of cooking, I carefully carried the pot inside and served up my wild clay pot cooked venison and vegetable stew with dumplings. If I'm honest, the venison could probably have stood a little bit more cooking. It wasn't tough, but it wasn't meltingly tender. Everything tasted great though, and the combination of all those root vegetables, herbs, mushrooms and venison, together with the ale, made for a really hearty and tasty dish. I think I could have added more of the kidney. I know a lot of people don't like eating kidney, but it turns out venison kidney is really mild tasting. So it was there, but only just. The dumplings had cooked light and fluffy, and they were just right to soak up the broth at the bottom of my bowl. There was a light smoky flavour to this stew. I suppose it's inevitable that some of the wood smoke would have made its way in somehow. But there was no trace of any flavour that I could attribute to the clay itself. So that part is a definite success. I ate the lot and it was hugely satisfying. I did add a bit of pepper once I'd tasted it as it was. After cooking, I washed and scrubbed the pot in hot water, but I don't want to use any detergent on it as that might just soak in. In olden times, an earthenware cooking pot would be used continuously. So any food residue that remained from one session to the next would just get burned off on the outside or cooked into the clay or dissolved into the next meal. So that's the happy conclusion of this adventure of cooking in wild clay pottery. It's been quite a journey, but a very enjoyable one. The taste of the stew I cooked is all the sweeter when seasoned with success after difficulty. Before we go, there's one more thing I must just show you. Back at the start of this series, I had intended to dig the clay from my own garden, but the drought we were having at the time made that impossible. So I had to source the clay from a place where it was being dug mechanically in a neighbor's garden. Now we're in November and we've had nearly a month of solid rain. I'm just going to dig that hole in my garden just to show you what the clay is like under my own lawn. As you can see, it's very similar to the clay that we used for making these pots. And it should be because this sort of clay underlies the entire area. I hope you've enjoyed joining me in this series and I've got plans to do some more pottery stuff in future, as well as perhaps tackle some other different sorts of projects where I begin from scratch and build towards a goal that's built on the success of the crafting in previous steps. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you again soon.